When she revived, she found to her great surprise that she was lying in her own bed at home. And what was more, that she had on the loveliest lace nightcap that she had ever seen in her life. At first she thought that all her adventures, the terrible lions, and her promise to the yellow dwarf that he should marry Bellissima, must have been a dream. But there was the new cap with its beautiful ribbon and lace to remind her that it was all true, which made her so unhappy that she could neither eat, drink, nor sleep for thinking of it. The princess, who, in spite of her willfulness, really loved her mother with all her heart, and was much grieved when she saw her looking so sad, and often asked her what was the matter. But the queen, who didn't want her to find out the truth, only said that she was ill, or that one of her neighbors was threatening to make war against her. Bellissima knew quite well that something was being hidden from her, and that neither of these was the real reason of the queen's uneasiness. So she made up her mind that she would go and consult the fairy of the desert about it, especially as she had often heard how wise she was, and she thought at the same time she might ask her advice as to whether it would be as well to be married or not. So, with great care, she made some of the proper cake to pacify the lions, and one night went up to her room very early, pretending that she was going to bed. But instead of that, she wrapped herself in a long white veil, and went down a secret staircase, and set off all by herself to find the witch. But when she got as far as that same fatal orange tree, and saw it covered with flowers and fruit, she stopped and began to gather some of the oranges, and then, putting down her basket, she sat down to eat them. But when it was time to go on again, the basket had disappeared, and though she looked everywhere, not a trace of it could she find. The more she hunted for it, the more frightened she got, and at last she began to cry. Then all at once she saw before her the yellow dwarf. "'What's the matter with you, my pretty one?' said he. "'What are you crying about?' "'Alas,' she answered, "'no wonder that I am crying, seeing that I have lost the basket of cake that was to help me get safely to the cave of the fairy of the desert. And what do you want with her, pretty one?' said the little monster, for I am a friend of hers, and, for the matter of that, I am quite as clever as she is. The queen, my mother, replied the princess, has lately fallen into such a deep sadness that I fear that she will die, and I am afraid that perhaps I am the cause of it, for she very much wishes me to be married." and I must tell you that as yet I have not found anyone I consider worthy to be my husband. So, for all these reasons, I wish to talk to the fairy. Do not give yourself any further trouble, princess, answered the dwarf. I can tell you all you want to know better than she could. The queen, your mother, has promised you in marriage. Has promised me? interrupted the princess. Oh, oh no! I'm sure she has not. She would have told me if she had. I am too much interested in the matter for her to promise anything without my consent. You must be mistaken. Beautiful princess, cried the dwarf suddenly, throwing himself on her knees before her. I flatter myself that you will not be displeased at her choice when I tell you that it is to me she has promised the happiness of marrying you. You? cried Bellissima, starting back. My mother wishes me to marry you? How can you be so silly as to think such a thing? It isn't that I care much to have that honor, cried the dwarf angrily. But here are the lions coming. They'll eat you up in three mouthfuls, and there will be an end of you and your pride. And indeed, at that moment, the poor princess heard the dreadful howls coming nearer and nearer. "'What shall I do?' she cried. "'Must all my happy days come to an end like this?' The malicious dwarf looked at her and began to laugh spitefully. "'At least,' said he, "'you have the satisfaction of dying unmarried. A lovely princess like you must surely prefer to die rather than be the wife of a poor little dwarf like myself.' 
Oh, don't be angry with me, cried the princess, clasping her hands. I'd rather marry all the dwarfs in the world than to die in this horrible way. Look at me well, princess, before you give me your word, said he. I don't want you to promise me in a hurry. Oh, cried she, the lions are coming. I have looked at you enough. I am so frightened. Save me this minute, or I shall die of terror. Indeed, as she spoke, she fell down insensible. And when she recovered, she found herself in her own bed at home. How she got there, she could not tell. But she was dressed in the most beautiful lace and ribbons. And on her finger was a little ring, made of a single red hair which fitted so tightly, try as she might, she could not get it off. When the princess saw all these things and remembered what had happened, she too fell into the deepest sadness, which surprised and alarmed the whole court and the queen more than anyone else. A hundred times she asked Bellissima if anything was the matter with her, but always she said that there was nothing. At last the chief men of the kingdom, anxious to see the princess married, sent to the queen to beg her to choose a husband for her as soon as possible. She replied that nothing would please her better, but that her daughter seemed so unwilling to marry, and she recommended them to go and talk to the princess about it themselves. So this they at once did. Now Bellissima was much less proud since her adventure with the yellow dwarf, and she could not think of a better way of getting rid of the little monster than to marry some powerful king. Therefore she replied to their request much more favorably than they had hoped, saying that though she was very happy as she was, still, to please them, she would consent to marry the king of the gold mines. Now he was a very handsome and powerful prince, who had been in love with the princess for years, but had not thought that she would ever care about him at all. You can easily imagine how delighted he was when he heard the news and how angry it made all the other kings to lose forever the hope of marrying the princess. But, after all, Bellissima could not have married twenty kings. Indeed, she had found it quite difficult enough to choose one, for her vanity made her believe that there was nobody in the world who was worthy of her. Preparations were begun at once for the grandest wedding that had ever been held at the palace. The king of the gold mines sent such immense sums of money, that the whole sea was covered with ships that brought it. Messengers were sent to all the gayest and most refined courts, particularly of the court of France, to seek out everything rare and precious to adorn the princess, although her beauty was so perfect that nothing she wore could make her look prettier. At least that is what the king of the gold mines thought, and he was never happy unless he was with her. As for the princess, the more she saw of the king, the more she liked him. He was so generous, so handsome and clever, that at last she was almost as much in love with him as he was with her. How happy they were as they wandered about in the beautiful gardens together, sometimes listening to sweet music. And the king used to write songs for Bellissima. This is the one that she liked very much. In the forest all is gay When my princess walks that way all the blossoms then are found downward fluttering to the ground hoping she may tread on them and bright flowers on slender stem gaze up at her as she passes brushing lightly through the grasses oh my princess birds above echo back our songs of love as through this enchanted land, blithe we wander hand in hand. They were really as happy as the day was long. All the king's unsuccessful rivals had gone home in despair. They said good-bye to the princess so sadly that she could not help being sorry for them. Ah, madam, the king of the gold mine said to her, How is this? Why do you waste your pity on these princes, who love you so much that all their trouble would be well repaid by a single smile from you? I should be sorry, answered Bellissima, if you had not noticed how much I pitied these princes who were leaving me forever. 
but for you, sire, it is very different. You have every reason to be pleased with me, but they are going sorrowfully away, so you must not grudge them my compassion. The king of the gold mines was quite overcome by the princess's good-natured way of taking his interference, and, throwing himself at her feet, he kissed her hand a thousand times and begged her to forgive him. At last the happy day came. Everything was ready for Bellissima's wedding. The trumpets sounded, all the streets of the town were hung with flags and strewn with flowers, and the people ran in crowds to the great square before the palace. The queen was so overjoyed that she had hardly been able to sleep at all, and she got up before it was light to give the necessary orders, and to choose the jewels that the princess was to wear. These were nothing less than diamonds, even to her shoes, which were covered with them, and her dress of silver brocade was embroidered with a dozen of the sun's rays. You may imagine how much these had cost, but then nothing could have been more brilliant except the beauty of the princess. Upon her head she wore a splendid crown, her lovely hair waved nearly to her feet, and her stately figure could easily be distinguished among all the ladies who attended her. The king of the gold mines was not less noble and splendid. It was easy to see by his face how happy he was, and everyone who went near him returned loaded with presents for all around the great banqueting hall had been arranged a thousand barrels full of gold, and numberless bags made of velvet embroidered with pearls and filled with money, each one containing at least a hundred thousand gold pieces, which were given away to everyone who would like to hold out his hand, which numbers of people hastened to do, you may be sure. Indeed, some found this by far the most amusing part of the wedding festivities. The queen and the princess were just ready to set out with the king, when they saw, advancing toward them from the end of the long gallery, two great basilisks, dragging after them a very badly made box. Behind them came a tall old woman, whose ugliness was even more surprising than her extreme old age. She wore a ruff of black taffeta, a red velvet hood, and a farthingale all in rags and she leaned heavily upon a crutch. The strange old woman, without saying a single word, hobbled three times round the gallery, followed by the basilisks, and then stopping in the middle, and brandishing her crutch threateningly, she cried, Ho, ho, queen! Ho, ho, princess! Do you think you are going to break with impunity the promise that you made to my friend the Yellow Dwarf? I am the Fairy of the Desert. Without the Yellow Dwarf and his orange tree, my great lions would soon have eaten you up, I can tell you. And in Fairyland we do not suffer ourselves to be insulted like this. Make up your minds at once what you will do. For I vow that you shall marry the yellow dwarf. If you don't, may I burn my crutch. Ah, oh, princess, said the queen, weeping. What is this that I hear? What have you promised? Ah, oh, my mother, replied Bellissima sadly. What did you promise yourself? The king of the gold mines, indignant at being kept from his happiness by this wicked old woman, went up to her and, threatening her with his sword, said, Get away out of my country at once, and forever, miserable creature, lest I take your life and so rid myself of your malice. He had hardly spoken these words when the lid of the box fell back on the floor with a terrible noise, and into their horror out sprang the yellow dwarf mounted upon a great Spanish cat. "'Rash youth!' he cried, rushing between the fairy of the desert and the king. "'Dare to lay a finger on this illustrious fairy? Your quarrel is with me only. I am your enemy and your rival. That faithless princess, who would have married you, is promised to me. See if she has not upon her finger a ring made of one of my hairs.' Just try to take it off, and you will soon find out that I am more powerful than you are. 
"'Wretched little monster,' said the king, "'do you dare to call yourself the princess's lover "'and to lay claim to such a treasure? "'Do you know that you are a dwarf, "'that you are so ugly that one cannot bear to look at you, "'and that I should have killed you myself long before this "'if you had been worthy of such a glorious death?' The yellow dwarf, deeply enraged at these words, set spurs to his cat, which yelled horribly, and leaped hither and thither, terrifying everybody except the brave king, who pursued the dwarf closely till he, drawing a great knife with which he was armed, challenged the king to meet him in single combat, and rushed down to the courtyard of the palace with a terrible clatter. The king, quite provoked, followed him hastily, but they had hardly taken their places facing one another, and the whole court had only just had time to rush out upon the balconies to watch what was going on, when suddenly the sun became red as blood, and it was so dark that they could scarcely see at all. The thunder crashed, and the lightning seemed as if it must burn up everything. The two basilisks appeared, one on each end of the bad dwarf, like giants, mountains high, and fire flew from their mouths and ears until they looked like flaming furnaces. None of these things could terrify the noble young king, and the boldness of his looks and actions reassured those who were looking on, and perhaps even embarrassed the yellow dwarf himself. But even his courage gave way when he saw what was happening to his beloved princess, for the fairy of the desert, looking more terrible than before, mounted upon a winged griffin, and with long snakes coiled round her neck, had given her such a blow with the lance she carried that Bellissima fell into the queen's arms bleeding and senseless. Her fond mother, feeling as much hurt by the blow as the princess herself, uttered such piercing cries and lamentations that the king, hearing them, entirely lost his courage and presence of mind. Giving up the combat, he flew toward the princess, to rescue her or die with her. But the yellow dwarf was too quick for him. Leaping with the Spanish cat upon the balcony, he snatched Bellissima from the queen's arms, and before any of the ladies of the court could stop him, he had sprung upon the roof of the palace and disappeared with his prize. 